Chapter 12, Passport Wednesday, May 7th, 1986 Uma and I were second and third online at the passport office. We were standing behind a panicked Pakistani-American who was headed home to meet his bride-to-be, who had been carefully chosen for him by his parents. He seemed to have to tell me about it as we waited for all the workers to arrive and windows to open up. I was stuck there half listening. I'd rather him tell me than tell Uma. I think it was Uma, though, who inspired him and made him feel comfortable confiding in us. I'm certain she was something familiar, wrapped in her colorful thobe, from head to toe and delicate as a tropical flower. She had accompanied me just in case the authorities here required any sudden additional and random signatures. We were prepared. Now she stood in silent anticipation, her slim fingers wearing faded but fascinating henna designs as she clutched a manila folder containing our neatly organized official papers and identification. Uma was also completing passport forms for herself and Naja. She had decided that even though she and Naja would not receive their passports until six weeks later, it was best for our little family to all have the same official documents. Arriving early definitely paid off. Everything was signed and stamped in less than two hours. You can pick up your passport anytime on Friday. Bring your identification and receipt from your payment. The tired, older woman buried behind her bifocal said, I wondered, how could she be so exhausted when her workday had just started? Alhamdulillah, Uma said thankfully. This was much quicker than how things are done at government offices in our Sudan. I'm surprised, really. I knew that her gratefulness was genuine. It was rare to hear Uma compliment any aspect of living in America. Outside, I looked up at the sky and I saw the sun lurking behind the clouds. I took it as a promise that things would improve. It was a warm spring morning and Uma wore a cream-colored dress underneath her thobe that swirled gently around her ankles and revealed only her cream leather-heeled sandals. I'm going to dress victoriously. She had said early this morning after dawn prayer, I'm going to dress as though we have already won all of our battles. I won't let one person darken our day. I felt good walking down the street with her. I believe that her presence alone caused good things to happen. Her subtle and sweet scent seemed to encourage a friendly response from strangers who began greeting us for no apparent reason. Attendants in the shops we entered were unusually helpful. In the Armani shop on 52nd and Park Avenue, Uma watched intently as the attendant helped me into a new suit jacket that she insisted I try. Tall, dark, and handsome, the woman assisting me said, and looked at Uma, who had no idea what she was saying because she was speaking English. My Uma only speaks Arabic. But the woman was smiling as she was suiting me up, so Uma returned her smile, confident that her colorful thobe was working its charm. Finally, Uma chose her favorite suit. When you meet Akimi's father for the first time, inshallah, be sure to wear this exact suit. The suit does not make you into the man that you already are, but it does distinguish you for the shallow men who will judge you this way. This suit makes you stand out, Uma said, gesturing her approval with her talking hands. Akimi's father needs to know and understand that you are also someone's child and that you are loved and cherished with the culture, faith, and business and that you are not lacking in any way. She continued in passionate Arabic, caught up not just in the return of her daughter-in-law, but in pleasing and convincing Akimi's father. Your language sounds really nice. What is it? The store attendant asked. Arabic, I answered. Wow, really? I would never have guessed, she said, seeming surprised and a little unsure. I purchased the suit to please Uma, period. I was not interested in impressing Naoko Nakamura. In the shoe store next door, the shoes designed by Bruno Mugliani best complimented my foot and the Armani suit. For a few hundred dollars, they became mine. I was watching my money pile closely. I didn't want to see my father's diamond disappear, 
without my holding something of true and great value in my hands in exchange. For me, this would not be this suit or these shoes. It would only be my wife. Uma read my thoughts, it seemed. She opened her leather purse and came out with ten $100 bills. The suit is my gift to you. Put this away with the rest of your money. I accepted her sincerity and thought to myself, this is how it is between my mother and I. We are both giving each other everything that we have to give so our blessings in life keep going back and forth between us. Afterward, I led her into the Hunter's and Wilderness store and Paragon's for the rugged wear that I preferred to rock. We shared a meal at a restaurant that Uma selected because of its name, the Tamarind. Uma loved the sweet taste of this tropical fruit and even used it in her cooking from time to time. When she saw the unshelled tamarind dangling in the restaurant window, she nudged me and we stepped inside. It was an elegant place, each dining area secluded by a beautiful curtain. The cuisine was Indian, but the decor was familiar to us, the Sudanese. Once seated, Uma closed the curtain and relaxed her thaw covering. She and I ate comfortably, yet lightly. We shared palak paneer and dal taka. Instead of any of the wonderful breads that come from India, we had vegetable samosa. It's something like a beef patty, but instead of beef, it's seasoned vegetables and potatoes stuffed and tucked in a fried triangular bread. Soon after the meal, an Indian approached, smiling ear to ear. His nameplate had only one word on it, one really long name with 18 letters. He drew back the curtains and held it tightly in his left hand. Immediately, he introduced himself as the manager and offered two complimentary dishes of coconut ice cream. A gift for your bride, he said, staring at Uma. She is my mother, I corrected him. Oh, Mother India, he exclaimed happily. No, I said seriously, while giving him the stare of a polite warning. He then shifted his focus onto me, asking, Oh, but she is not from India? She is wearing henna. Is she Arab then? No, I said, feeling impatient. What then? African. I answered in an even tone. African, he repeated, looking puzzled. I thanked him for his creams and told him to please release the curtain. I was used to Uma drawing attention. Like the sun, even when fully covered, she was still radiating. Please come again. The manager extended his business card to me as we were preparing to leave. I accepted it politely, then grabbed Uma's hand and carried our shopping bags in the other. We taxied directly back to Brooklyn for a few dollars over the normal price.